Hey guys, Matt here from Sweat Elite. I'm currently in Chicago, here at the Nike headquarters. Unfortunately, this video is not a filmed training session with Galen Rupp. I wish that it was, and I hope that there will be one coming soon. But it is an interview that I conducted yesterday here at the Nike headquarters with Galen Rupp, with three days to go until the Chicago Marathon. Unfortunately, we weren't able to film the interview due to the social distancing restrictions and sitting a little bit far apart. But this video will be the audio of the interview with Galen Rupp from yesterday, and we will put an overlay of him here in the studio as well. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Galen. We spoke about his training leading up to the Chicago Marathon, how his training has been a lot better leading into Chicago than it was before the Olympics. We speak about the tight turnaround from the Olympics in that there was a nine week break between the two. We speak about his transition to training with Mike Smith. And we speak about other things such as visualization tactics, his fueling strategies, and why he doesn't participate in social media much at all. So I hope that you enjoy this interview with Galen Rupp. Welcome to the Sweat Elite Podcast. This is Matt, host of the Sweat Elite Podcast. Thanks for tuning into this episode that's being recorded from Chicago in the USA. Here in the lead up to the Chicago Marathon, working on some videography and podcasts with some of Nike's distance runners, some that are competing this weekend at the Chicago Marathon, including who this podcast episode's interviewee is, Galen Rupp. Now, many of you listening to this will be quite familiar with Galen Rupp and his accomplishments, but for those who are not, Galen Rupp is a two-time Olympic medalist. He won silver in the 10,000 meters at the 2012 Olympic Games for the USA. He won bronze in the 2016 Rio Olympics in the marathon. He has a marathon personal best of 206.07, a 10K personal best of 26.44, and a 5K personal best of 12.58. Yeah, he's won multiple national championships. He is, as I mentioned, one of the US's best ever distance runners. And I was thrilled to have the opportunity to speak with Galen in the lead up to the Chicago Marathon. He spoke quite a bit about his training, which I was surprised about given that he hasn't shared a lot about it in the past. He's recently moved to a new coach in Mike Smith a couple of years ago. So we speak a bit about that. We speak about his fueling strategies going into the Chicago Marathon, what he typically uh, has planned before a marathon in terms of fueling. We talk about social media and why he doesn't, why he doesn't really use social media at all. We talk about visualization strategies and much, much more. I really enjoyed this conversation with Galen Rupp at Nike headquarters, and I hope you do too. So I'll transition over to the interview now. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Galen Rupp. Galen Rupp, thanks for joining the Sweat Elite podcast. We're here in Chicago at the Nike headquarters, and you're only eight, uh, sorry, nine weeks after the Olympic Games. How are you feeling going into the weekend, Chicago Marathon? I'm feeling great. You know, uh, actually, the last six, eight weeks of training has been better than anything I did before the Olympics. So uh, I'm really excited, really ready to go. Um, and also tight turnaround, but uh, I think we had a really good plan in place, Mike and I. And uh, you're, you're always riding a fine line, you know, with resting, making sure you recover from obviously a big marathon, but also trying to take advantage of all the training that you've done before and, and continue to build on that, you know, and not throw that away by taking it too easy. But mm-hmm. it's a fine line you ride. You, know, you don't want to overcook yourself either by coming back too soon. But uh, we had a real great plan, real great plan and uh, yep. training's been going great. Awesome. Um, would you be able to dive a little bit deeper into like how much rest you took after the Olympics? Because like you said, nine weeks is a pretty tight turnaround. Um, what did that week or two look like after after Tokyo or Sapporo? Yeah, so the first week didn't do any workouts. Um, mm-hmm. I think I maybe did strides once, but uh, it's just really easy running. You know, easy easy jogging, and you know, he's like, just imagine you're running with your grandma or something. Like it should be that slow. You know, the whole purpose is really just to flush your legs out. You know, this isn't necessarily about training or getting any fitter, but as bad as it might feel or as bad as it might sound at the time, you know, to go out and run after running a marathon, you really, I noticed I felt much better after doing some of these easy runs. You know, my legs were definitely trashed, you know, they were heavy, but just going really slow, getting my blood moving, it was really great for my recovery. And he told me that week mentally too, which I think is just as important as the physical side, just get away from running, you know, don't worry about anything. Don't even think about training. Obviously you're going out for your daily run, but 
I don't want you to look at this week as, as necessarily a, a training week. This should be almost like a, a week off, but you're still running. Yeah. And um, so really just getting away, you know, taking some time with my family and doing some of the things that are harder to do when you're training because you don't have time, you know, and just getting your mind off of everything, I think was real important for me. And then that second week, you know, we did some real light workouts. You know, he called them bridge workouts, you know, just to kind of get your body back used to moving. And, um, again, you're going to feel a little little tired and sore when you first start to work out and run hard. But uh, I have to go back and look. But it was maybe two or three workouts that week, but, but very, very easy. Mm -hmm. And then that third week, we were back to hitting it hard. You know, I was back up to, you know, running I mean, I was definitely over 100 miles that week and uh you know hitting hard workouts again like i normally would and uh ever since then we've just been continuing to hit it and training and, and keep it rolling it's exciting that you say that the last six weeks or so has been some of the best training that you've done um be good to dive into that if you if you can i mean yeah you said it's, it was probably a better preparation before than before the olympics definitely better than the olympics yeah yeah, yeah. i don't know if i'd say like that i've ever done in my life but uh it's been been pretty close you know up there you know i think just uh had some bad luck before the Olympics, frankly, you know, with not being able to hit some of the key workouts, uh, you know, physically, just had some small things that came up. Um, it was nothing major, but again, the timing was just bad. And, and that happens, you know, that's training. Everybody deals with small injuries and um, it was just bad luck. I felt like that I wasn't able to hit some of the big long runs, um, some of the bigger workouts. Uh, we had to cut them short or uh, just couldn't hit the times, you know, physically, but uh, that hasn't been the case. You know, I've been, hitting or exceeding everything uh, since the Olympics and had a real great long run, you know, did my last hard one uh, two weeks before, I mean, two weeks before the race on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went really well. You know, I went 25 miles all together. I think probably 21 or 22 of it was really hard. Okay. Um, and uh, that's always been a real, real staple, you know, those long runs, yeah. uh, doing them hard and uh, just doing them consistently. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. You know, looking back at everything before, uh, before the Olympics, I had some great workouts, but nothing replaces just the consistency of, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of having solid, consistent workouts. You sure. know, there's no substitute for that. Um, and I was lucky that I was able to have that now before Chicago. Awesome. So on the training front, really appreciate you diving into that a bit more, but what have been the major differences between sort of previous coach and, and Mike Smith now? Has there been any, any major changes uh, along the way there's definitely been some uh yeah. you know i've done some done some more fartlek workouts which i didn't really do a whole lot of you know uh you know before when i was on the track every once in a while i'd run 30 40s you know we run 230 mm. run a 240 just do that continuously for for miles and miles um and uh but that was really about it and just a lot more like timed recovery you know i would say before um, I probably took a little more recovery during some of the intervals. Um, and the intervals themselves were probably a little bit quicker, but, you know, it's kind of like just a different route to get to the top of the mountain. You know, you can run things a little bit slower, but you really cut down the rest and, and they're really tough. Mm -hmm. Or if you take more rest, you better be hitting those intervals pretty darn hard that, you know, you need every second of that. Yeah. You know, it's not just like you're milking it to try to make the workout easier. So. Uh, I would say that's a little bit more of a difference, but uh, Mike's been awesome. You know, we've we've gone over a lot of training that I've done, you know, for marathons in the past, and he's really done done a good job of incorporating some of the things that uh, have worked well and that I've thought have worked really well for me in the past. Um, but also, you know, definitely giving me some more workouts that that he thinks are beneficial. And um, you know, when we first started working together, that was one of the things that I really really respected and loved about him is that he was very honest with finding holes and 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 I loved that you know I, I didn't want someone that was just going to say you know yeah everything that that I want to do sounds great you know I think uh one of the hardest things to do probably is to is to coach yourself you know because you just you start making emotional decisions and you know a coach I think has a lot more of a kind of objective approach sometimes than, than an athlete does and um, you know, it's easier for them sometimes to, to see the forest from the trees and to say, like, you know, we need to back off here or, you know, we need to do a little less here, we need to do a little more. Um, that's where it really comes into, into play. Awesome. So you, at least you were quite a big advocate of cross-training, uh, more specifically, you know, the L2G. Uh, I've seen, you know, videos and photos of water running as well. Are you still doing that, that sort of work as well? I still do some cross-training for sure. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, uh, whether it's yeah underwater treadmill, I've used that a lot. Um, I've I've run in a pool a lot too. You know, mine's actually uh, been broken a little bit, so I haven't been able to use that as much as I normally would. But uh, you know, I've been just getting in a pool and aqua jogging. I think is a, a great thing as well. 
Um, it's it's more of a recovery thing. Um, you know, Ultra G is a tremendous tool. Um, you know that I've used a lot and, and still do use. Uh, but the biggest thing for me with with cross training has always been that it's just a way to kind of add in some extra aerobic fitness that really reduces the the risk of injury. I mean, it really reduces the pounding and um, you know, because that's that's the killer. You know, anybody can run maybe a ridiculous amount of miles for any one week or two weeks or three weeks, but when you get hurt, it kind of goes away real quick. You can't do anything. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really always been about just mitigating risk, and that's a tremendous way to still get some extra fitness. You know, I I don't think that at a certain point your body can tell the difference. You know, it's like, oh, well, I did so many miles running or I did so many hours in the pool or so many hours on the bike, whatever it is, you know, it can't tell. It's just it's cardiovascular fitness. And whether you get that from running or get that from something else, I don't think it makes that big of a difference. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you can't say I'm never going to run and just do all this other stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, it, that's always been the way that I've looked at it. And, you know, it's just a way to get in some extra fitness and really reduce the risk of injury and, and the pounding on your body. And especially, you know, as you start to get older as an athlete, I think that stuff can even come more into play where you got to find – sometimes other ways to get that cardiovascular fitness, but that's something that continues to build year after year. You know, if anything, when you get older, I believe that you should be focusing more on speed work, more on ballistic stuff, you know, things in the weight room, all that, because that's what really starts to go. You know, if you're looking at, you know, everybody uses that analogy of a car and a distance runner, like your engine is so big. If you've had years and years and years of training, the older you get, but that power and how fast you can get off the line, that's what can start to get out of whack more. And you got to almost pay more attention to that than necessarily keep trying to do so many longer intervals or so many, you know, just volume and training and, and negate, you know, sprinting, running fast and doing those shorter intervals. Sure. I've also heard that you're quite a fan of plyometric work. Um, firstly, is that true? And secondly, you know, are you, you know, how much of that do you normally incorporate into the training? I am a fan, yeah. I've yeah. kind of gone through periods where I've done a lot of it and periods where I haven't. Um, I haven't done as much as I probably would have liked, I should say, uh, the last couple of years. Part of that's just been, you know, physically I wasn't able to. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that it's tremendously important to do. You know, I've always loved doing ladder drills. Uh, anything, I think, that helps keep your overall athleticism is just so important, you know, as a runner. We run in straight lines all the time, and, you know, the more you do it, if you stop doing all these other movements and and moving on different planes and using these different types of muscles, that's when you do get really stiff, and ultimately I think that leads to injury. Um, And so keeping athleticism and, you know, staying mobile, you know, you got to be careful that you don't play sports, that you get hurt or do something like that. But uh, I think it's it's huge to to keep doing, you know, the more power and – and speed that you have, it, even in the marathon, I think it just helps you tremendously. Like speed kills. That's what ultimately what wins races on the track. You know, they come down to a kick. In the marathon, I think they help so much with efficiency. You know, if a guy can run super fast for a mile still, he's gonna be able to relax that much more running 440, 450. You know, at marathon pace than someone whose max is maybe 410, 420, just closer to their max. So it's gonna take, of course, it's gonna take more out of them. So still important to keep all that stuff going. Sure. So another random, uh, a bit of a random question that I was very curious about that I hadn't yet found the answer about. It's, it's dating back to the Olympics in the, in the middle of the marathon. Uh, I'm sure you've answered plenty of questions about that particular race, but there was one instance when Kipchoge looked back at you and he said something and he seemed like he was maybe angry i'm not sure and you, you sort of laughed at him and gave him a smile what, what was that about he wasn't at all like uh, oh, he wasn't? yeah a lot of people thought he was like really mad or really angry it kind of looked yeah, like he was yeah I, no. I i don't remember exactly what he said but i remember it still being like kind of friendly you know and okay. saying just like i don't know if he said like you want to take the lead right. or you know something but yeah and i saw him after the race and he was all smiles and just was like hey how you doing are you feeling all right and that he's a just a great guy and I, it wasn't anything malicious that's for sure okay okay and i guess the conditions this weekend are probably going to be a little similar to support maybe slightly cooler yeah um so i feel like you've maybe got that advantage of, of having already been through that um did you do any any heat training before the olympics and have you have you incorporated that like past the olympics as well leading into this weekend 
Absolutely, yeah. I, I can't say that I've done as much heat training as I did before the Olympics, um, just because you never know, you know, and obviously if you don't, you're not going to be doing that stuff all the time. If Excuse me, if there's a big chance that you're not going to deal with that in the race. But uh, it's always something that you have to be cognizant of coming to Chicago at this time of year that could be a little warmer and humid. Um, so, uh, yeah, I still do do a lot of runs. I generally layer up a lot when I run, even when it's warmer out. You know, I like to get a real good sweat going when yeah. I run. Um, I do a lot of runs on my treadmill at home. And, you know, especially as we start getting closer and closer to this race, uh, you just – don't turn the fans on, get it pretty hot and humid in the room that it's in down there. And so uh, there's been a lot of times where I've run, yeah, mid seventies and mid 70% humidity. So it's a, uh, it's definitely warm in there when I'm running. Yeah, and sure. before, before Japan, uh, I was doing a lot of heat training, you know, a lot of running in sweats, a lot of running, you know, chambers where you can really get the heat and humidity up. And uh, it's just something, the more you can prepare your body for difficult conditions like that, you got to do it. Um, you never want it to be, a total shock and I, I'm a big believer in you know just continually putting your body in the same situations or, or worse than what you're going to face is only going to prepare you better to be able to deal with that. Very true. So you mentioned you, you use the treadmill in your home did you have you spent much time over the last eight weeks nine weeks in in Flagstaff at altitude or? No I've no, no, been, been at home the whole time in Portland oh. yeah since the Olympics up uh, through this build up. Okay. No altitude tent, no sort of altitude training this time around at all? No, I still, still use yeah, simulated oh, al- still use simulated altitude for sure. Yeah, yeah at my house, absolutely. Yep. No, I think that's that's really important. And I'm, I'm real lucky and fortunate, you know, the, the setup that I got there. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's always been a big part of my training for sure. Awesome. I switch now to talking more about um, a topic that I guess people are curious about, and it's, it's shoes. Are you, a, are you a vapor fly, alpha fly guy? What do you prefer to race in? And curious to know what you prefer to train in as well. I love them both, you know, okay. uh, yeah, and I, I train in them both. Uh, I've raced in them both. Uh, obviously, some of my best races have come in a, in a vapor fly uh, as far as time goes. Um, I've only run in the alpha fly as far as racing, I think, twice in the trials and then the Olympics. Uh, those were the only ones, so... Um, I'll still probably wear the Alpha Fly in this. Okay. You know, I, I definitely prefer them for a marathon. Uh, I think both are good. You know, you, you obviously got to go with uh, what feels best to you. And I think depending on how you run, one shoe might feel better than the other. But uh, they're both tremendous. You know, it's yeah. uh, they're, they've been amazing. And, and especially in training, I guess in racing too, like just the recovery that they add is, is huge. Sure. You know, and that's the... One of the biggest things, and I know, you know, when there was talk about are they going to be allowed or not, like, that was one of my biggest problems with that. Is the people that didn't want them to be allowed is like, this is going to help not, not only elite runners, but everybody. Like, it's just such a positive thing for running because you're not getting – you're not getting an unfair advantage because you're just getting more back from what you give in, but it's still not 100%, you know, what you put in the ground. And on top of that – it's going to help prevent injuries in so many people, you know, with the pounding and uh, they, they've been tremendous in training, coming off of long runs and, and doing all that. I just noticed that I'm able to recover so much better, you know, from those races and workouts and be able to come back and do it again. So I, I'm a huge fan of both, but I think it is kind of personal preference, you know, just on, on which one's better. But uh, for a marathon, yeah, I'll probably be rolling with the Alpha Fly on, uh, on okay. Sunday. Are you a Pegasus Vimera guy when, when, uh, <laughs> with the regular trainers? or I'm a structured triax guy oh, structure. through okay. and through. Yeah, that's the only shoe I've ever trained in, you wow. know, going back okay. to high school. And uh, it's what I still wear, what I do the majority of my miles in. Okay, okay. Interesting. Um, another topic that I've been curious about uh, with yourself, and it's, it's media and social media. So you don't seem to... To, to post a hell of a, I have a look at your Instagram before. You know, uh, that's today. not me. I've never been on Instagram oh, in my life. So I have no okay. idea who's doing that, but it ain't well, me. <laughs> someone, someone was posting for you about nine years ago. Uh, it hasn't been since then. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you stay off that stuff. and Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had I had Twitter at one point. You know, I think it started off in college before it was ever like a big thing. I was just doing it kind of with my buddies. Uh, and then I got off of it. Uh, Matthew and Mo got me back on it for a little bit. I think in 2012, they're like, oh, you got to do it. I tried it, but it's just not my thing. Like, I really don't like it. Okay. Um, you know, I, I get it. You know, I just, for me, it's never been about trying to say, look what I'm doing, look at attention. Like, you know, 
I don't know. It's just I, I, I don't – maybe I don't get it, yeah. but I just – Never really been a big fan of it, yeah. and uh, yeah, I just I see a lot of people that spend a, a lot of time, you know, as far as athletes go, like, you know, spend an inordinate amount of time, whether it's looking at it, trying to get things just right, or posting on it, and you don't know, just like, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go do my thing, I'm gonna go train, I'll go home and like spend all my time trying, trying to be with my family or doing that, yeah, like, it just, I. I yeah, I, I think there's a lot of positives to it, absolutely. Um, and there's, a, I, I get why people do it, but it's just, yeah, it's just never been my thing. I guess the best way to put it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm sure it's, uh, it's something that probably keeps you a little more focused than than, than other people. And, and on that, <laughs> and on that topic, um, we were curious beforehand talking about you know some of the things that we wanted to ask you. Do you incorporate any sort of visualization strategies into your training and racing? Is there anything that you do specifically before a race or maybe before a hard workout? Absolutely, yeah. Can, like no, it's, it's a huge part, yeah. and I, I think it's a, something that can benefit everybody. Cool. Um, and I think it's, I would say, it's real important to distinguish between visualization and daydreaming. You know, it's not about everything feeling great. You win in the race, or you run in a personal best, and you know, it just goes according to plan. Like those days happen. You know, you catch a flyer, and, and that's awesome. You got to roll with it when that does. You know, that's when you do something truly special, whether it's breaking a record or setting a PR. But I think with visualization, it's so much more important to really go through every scenario that you're going to deal with. And, and that comes from months and months of training. You know, visualization isn't something that you just sit down and say, I'm going to go through this one day or the day of the race or the day before. You know, I believe that it's something you need to be constantly working on. And going into a workout, you know, I always want to have a couple of things that I'm trying to get out of it, you know, and they could be really, really small things. but. I usually try to pick one, two, or three points that I'm trying to emphasize. And then, you know, take a little bit of time after every single workout and go over, like, how did you do? Did you accomplish those things that you wanted to do? What did you do well? What did you not do well? Um, you always want to be getting something out of every run, out of every training session. There should never be a day that you get that is just, I got to get through this. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to go do whatever else I have to do with my day. Like, that's just it's a, such a waste and everything needs to come back to racing you know like ultimately that's why you train and you have to constantly put every workout you do into a context of a race and you've got ideally you should be saying this has a purpose that is going to help me potentially in a race you know, whether it's closing hard whether it's you know some workouts i like to say are more just mental workouts like you're you go in exhausted you know you're dead from training running a lot of miles but you still got to hit those times. And it's almost more important that you hit those times in those days than the days that you're feeling good and maybe run faster. Because for me, like running on the track, it's always been about keeping your bad days as close to your good days as possible. You know, you see some, some people have bad days and they just, they give up. I mean, there's no, no other way to put it. And that's, that's just a mental thing. That they just don't want to do it. But great athletes, that run well every single race it seems like there's no way that they're feeling good every single time they told the line you know there's always little issues but they get so good at hiding that because it just doesn't matter and they drilled that into their heads that it doesn't matter how physically I'm feeling you still have to get up and perform and again we talk about catching those days where it's a flyer that's when you do something special but by and large, your days are more average or maybe you're feeling a little tired going into something. You still got to be able to perform. So yeah. for me, like when, when you get back, getting back to visualization, like it's got to be like an everyday thing that you're constantly evaluating and saying like, I did this in training and this is how it's going to help me in a race. And that work happens months before the race starts. You know, the, the week of a race, I don't think you should be doing too much mentally. You know, you really want to be more totally relaxed and have all that stuff ingrained in your head. But, yeah, visualization is about thinking more about the bad stuff that can happen, how you're going to deal with it, different scenarios. You know, if you got a guy that you think is going to surge, if you got a guy that's going to sit back and kick, a guy that's going to push, how are you going to respond to every single one of those scenarios so that by the time the race comes, it's all just reacting. You know, you don't want to be thinking, do I go, do I not, oh, what do I do, like in a race? That stuff should already be so ingrained in your head from doing visualization like every day that you just, it's automatic. You just go. And that's how you perform your best, I think. Wow, plenty of, uh, plenty of insight there. Two more questions I have for you. I know you uh, have to get going soon, but 
what is your fueling strategy in the race? Do you have a set time that you take gels or or uh, electrolytes, or is it more judging how you feel through the race? How do you how do you approach that? I usually will go. Yeah, I'll, I'll start drinking as soon as the first aid station. Okay. You know, I definitely try to drink like every aid station, and uh, you know, normally if if you if you wait till you're thirsty, you know, or you really feel like you need it, it's probably a little too late. You know, your body can only absorb so much uh, carbohydrates and um, sugar, or whatever. Um, that you, it's really something I think you got to be proactive about, and uh, you know, I think everybody's a little bit different, but for me, yeah, I, it starts at the first aid station, and, and I definitely try to drink every single way you know if i'm going to skip one it's going to be one of the last aid stations because i you know if your stomach's not feeling too hot or yeah you're you're like nothing you take in right there is is really going to affect those last like three miles you know of the race but i think it's it's much more important to to really get on at the beginning especially when you might not be feeling so thirsty um you know be proactive about that so your body has time to to absorb all those carbohydrates and and that energy and that's going to help you later on in the race awesome so last question, circling back to the topic that we spoke about at the start, and it's training. I'm curious to know what you most, uh, sorry, sorry, like the sort of training session that you find the most difficult, or the one that maybe beforehand that you look at and you think this is this is going to be really hard. Is it is it one of the long runs that you spoke spoke about at pace, or what's something that you just think, oof, this is this is going to be hard, but you know it's good for you? Oh, <laughs> I like. <laughs> I always love doing like 200s and 400s, like the shorter stuff. Those are by far my favorite okay. you know long runs i actually kind of like mm-hmm. um and they've they've come really naturally to me like i've always been really good at doing them even when i was on the track um that was always something that that just kind of came easy you know i had to work a lot harder to get speed as opposed you know like it was like frustrating almost training with most sometimes because i could get them on the longer stuff but as far as like sprinting or doing those short intervals it came so much easier to him I had to work my butt off like over the course of months to be able to to sprint and hit those short times like he could um but as far as like workouts i dreaded i was hated doing k's like you know 8 10 12 15 by a k those are just you got to do them but they are a grind from the start and they're never easy there's something about that distance i don't know what it is but <laughs> 800 has never seemed that bad but like you go up to a k and all of a sudden it feels like an eternity so <laughs> I would say like K's were the ones that, that I always dreaded. Um, you know, mild repeats are tough, and that's that's another thing that you got to do. But I think there's a little more gratification in saying you ran a bunch of miles in this time than than K's for some reason. <laughs> that's like some stupid psychological thing. But sure. yeah, K's were always the one that I dreaded, but but they're the best thing for you. Galen Rupp, really appreciate your time and all the best on Sunday. Thank you so much.